Matthew chapter 21. You will hear this text in the morning worship as well. I want us to think about Palm Sunday and perhaps explore some of the complexities of it in ways that we haven't before. If you kind of take a moment to think of what you know of Palm Sunday, a lot of it might boil down to historical information, um, the actual Passion Week, as it's called, the Week of Suffering of Christ that begins with the triumphal entry, as we call it, and then, of course, will lead through the events of the week, beginning with that Passover meal, uh, the betrayal, trials, execution, burial, and then the resurrection the following Sunday. But Palm Sunday itself, other than the historical timetable, sometimes is kind of just a, just sits there and, and we don't realize quite the, the loaded weight of Palm Sunday. It's a day of enormous tension. Uh, and I want us to explore the tension of Palm Sunday really as its theme, as its, as its purpose in, in, in the historical record. And there is a tension between One, the heaviness of unbelief and the hope of a remnant of believing ones. And we'll see that in the events of Palm Sunday and in the texts on which it relies. So I want us to begin in Matthew chapter 21, just to remind ourselves of the event, and then move to the prophet that is referenced, Zechariah. Uh, the psalm that unfolds in Matthew 21, that's Psalm 118, and then connect it to Isaiah chapter 6, which is the foundation of our text this morning in the conclusion of Acts chapter 28. So all these texts are going to come together to help us understand the tension of Palm Sunday, the heaviness of unbelief, offset by this hope of belief or a remnant of believing ones. Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before them and that followed them were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus. From Nazareth of Galilee. Familiar story. We see why it gets the name Palm Sunday when we think of them literally shaving off feathered branches from some of these trees as Jesus rode down into the valley and then up the steep incline to the entrance to Jerusalem itself. In this crowd, certainly, we could assume at least, there were some who believed, some who understood what was going on, some who knew what the prophets taught, Zechariah specifically. But we also know this is a crowd that is characterized generally by unbelief. We would see in just a few verses later in verse 15, the chief priests and scribes who saw this, and what they saw is described as the wonderful things, were indignant. They're they're put out by all of this. There was rank unbelief amidst anything that we could call belief or celebration of this entry of Jesus. 
just a few chapters later, so maybe even just a day or two later, Jesus would again come around the corner on the top of uh, the Mount of Olives and look down over Jerusalem and say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you like children under the wings of a hen, but you would not. So Jesus weeps at the unbelief of a city who just a day or two before had seemingly welcomed him in this great expression of faith, like, oh, come and save us. So we see the heaviness of unbelief. Jesus looks at Jerusalem and says, they want nothing to do with me. And yet we see at least the hope that maybe someone believes when we see this celebratory entrance in Matthew chapter 21. To understand the tension, then, we go to the prophet that is referenced. So turn back a few pages here. We'll hit Malachi when you leave Matthew going backwards. And then you'll hit Zechariah. And find your way to Zechariah chapter 9. You've just turned back a couple of hundred years. And we're now with the Israelites who left Captivity in Babylon, you remember Cyrus as the servant of the Lord. Um, Messiah language was used of Cyrus. He would be this anointed one to begin unfolding God's plan. Uh, This remnant then would leave the Babylonian captivity and they would come in three waves. You remember there's Zerubbabel, there's Ezra, there's Nehemiah. And that kind of reshapes the nation of Israel. We call it the period of post Exile. So after the exile, the people are back in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel, but they're struggling, even though this is the remnant. So this is that group that is kind of preserving the promise of God. They're still experiencing his faithfulness. He said he would restore and preserve a remnant. So this is the believing ones. And so we celebrate that hope of the remnant, and yet even among these believing ones, there is unbelief. There is disillusionment. There is discouragement. And so God brings in the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to encourage his people. And Zechariah encourages them, along with Haggai, to rebuild the temple, to get the walls going as Nehemiah comes on the scene, to hope in the promise of God. And so Zechariah, in the latter part of his prophecy, gives these words of hope and promise to be believed. Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, remember, we know Matthew 21. They did not, of course. So they're hearing these words, and it's just kind of picturesque language. Uh, a king riding on a donkey is, is fitting language. It was ceremonial. Um, this is hopeful language, but it's to this people who are discouraged. Uh, if you remember back when we studied through the Chronicles, Uh, This is the time when the Chronicles were written to encourage a people who thought, maybe God really is done with us because he brought us back to this land, but there's just not much here. This, This isn't the great celebration of renewal that we thought it would be. And so that exile people that heard the Chronicles story are are still struggling to kind of muster up the true excitement that this is the great plan of God. But now they're being told, rejoice greatly. Your king is coming. They're to be encouraged. They're supposed to offset the unbelief, that weightiness of unbelief with this hope that God is still doing his work to preserve a remnant of believing ones. The promise goes on, verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. Now you could go to other prophets and you'll find this language of peace connected to that coming Messiah. Whether it's Micah's prophecy of that one who would be raised up to shepherd his people, whether it's 
earlier in Isaiah, uh, the Prince of Peace, this language of peace is familiar. Zechariah is building on that, speaking to a people who have known much defeat, much warfare. The three sieges of Jerusalem that ended ultimately in the horrible descriptions of children being dashed on the rocks, having been cut out of their mother's wombs, the kind of the kind of horror and violence that was seen by this people is the backdrop for a prophet saying, there is coming a king who is going to reign in perfect peace. All of that stuff that gives you nightmares will be gone, will be done away with. Your king is coming. No more war, no more conflict, no more tension. No more ruin. And all of this, only a glimpse of the true peace that would come when that Messiah not only puts an end to the, the physical evil and consequence, but also deals with its root, the spiritual ruin and brokenness of sin that produces all of that evil. Your king is coming. His Rule, verse 10 ends, his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You could read of this in the Psalms and elsewhere in the prophets. This too is, is familiar language. To hear from the river to the ends of the earth or from sea to sea would in any Jewish mind call to mind the great songs of the Psalms and uh, the language of the prophets. This was this was fanciful language. This is almost like saying once upon a time and you speak of a glorious kingdom that just everything was good. Uh, this is what Disney tries to create with their castles and fairy tales and the beautiful endings and they lived happily ever after. That's the language of from the river to the ends of the earth. Like this is going to work. This, is, this will be the real deal. No more hoping in just David and then being disappointed by him as his kingdom, you know, is handed to Solomon and, and David has his grievous flaws. Solomon's the great hope and 40 years of triumph and Israel is a world empire only for that to come crashing down when he hands it to his sons and the kingdom splits because of Solomon's failures and lack of wisdom. No, no more hoping in a king only to be disappointed. This kingdom will last forever from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 11, and as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free. Blood of a covenant, so all kinds of Old Testament language there, the sacrificial system and all its bloodshed, the language of covenant, there's going to be a faithful God that implements this covenant and by his faithfulness, he will set his people free. So when Jesus comes saying in John, if the son will make you free, you will be free indeed. That's just not his own idea. He's, he's building on Old Testament language, the freedom of the captives, Isaiah 61, uh, here as well. There is a freedom that comes from that bondage of sin. Captives will be set free. So this is big language that the prophet is giving here in Zechariah. He wants these people who are struggling to believe to hear the promise of God in a full, robust kind of hope so that it's almost, we would say, easy to believe. Like how could you not long for what this prophet is describing? And in a sense, we would think maybe some were in Matthew chapter 21. Maybe there were true saints there crying out, save us, we pray. That's that word, Hosanna. Maybe they were remembering that the king would come riding on a donkey. Zechariah said as much, and here he is. Maybe there were some there who had been healed already or knew someone who was or heard the teaching and believed this is the Messiah. There's that hope of the remnant in the midst of the heaviness of unbelief. 
It's the tension of Palm Sunday. The thought that here is the parade for Jesus five days before the execution of Jesus. That alone historically gives us a tension to hang on to. It sounds great to read Matthew 21, but by the time you get to 26 and 7, it's, it's taken an ugly turn. And we feel that Palm Sunday is just a foreshadowing of, of these tensions between the heaviness of unbelief and that hope of a remnant. Back in Matthew chapter 21, when we actually hear them crying out in this celebration, verse 9, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So now we turn to Psalm 118 to find this language, the actual language that was used by the multitude. Psalm 118, let's look at verse 19. And again, the psalmist is writing, uh, but it's, it's often a helpful tool. It, it's, not a, it's not as clear as it could always be, but in the back of our minds to be thinking uh, how these psalms would be psalms that Christ himself sung. As a Jewish boy, of course, historically, uh, Jesus would have known these songs. But then in, in the sense of the fulfillment of the psalms, to think of Jesus singing these songs and knowing they were about him. Um, and so we're thinking of a psalmist writing this in hope, and we're also thinking of Christ fulfilling this hope of ours. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And so in our minds, we're thinking, is, is this the request of the psalmist? Is this righteous people entering the gates? Or is this Jesus himself, the righteous one, entering the gates, as in Psalm 24? And, and the answer is, it's kind of all of that. Fulfillment, ultimately, in righteousness in Christ. And he's riding into Jerusalem, and he's the one who is the, the entrance that you and I enter into to meet God in his presence. The Old Testament people came into the gates of Jerusalem to meet God, literally, in a physical place. Jesus says, I'm the temple now. You meet God in me. And so in this text, we're thinking, is this Jesus riding in, or is this the righteous coming into the city? And it's, it's all of that. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. A loaded passage in which we find those words of Matthew 21. Hosanna is an odd Hebrew word that seems to encapsulate the, the prayer, save us, we pray. So that's verse 25. Hosanna, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. So that's our link to Matthew 21, but now we want to see in Psalm 118 that same tension of Palm Sunday. The heaviness of unbelief and yet also the hope of a remnant of belief. And the hope is... There, it's these gates of righteousness being opened up. It's the righteous coming in to meet their God. It's this cry for 
deliverance and rescue and success and the realization that the one who comes in the name of the Lord is the God who does provide salvation. And so we thank him and we praise him for being our sacrifice. His steadfast love truly endures forever. But tucked away in familiar verses, we see the heaviness of unbelief, the stone that the builders rejected. The stone that the builders rejected. It's the heaviness of unbelief. The one who came to bring them light, the text says, and righteousness is rejected. And Romans 9 would tell us this is because the Jews had a righteousness of their own that they were holding up and saying, look what we can do. And they were boasting in their law keeping, but that was a miserable failure. They weren't keeping the law, not every single part of it, because to break any of the law is to be guilty of breaking all of it. So in their own self-righteousness, they were rejecting this righteousness that was offered to them. Embracing the darkness, they rejected the light that shined on them. Embracing God's agenda to build his church and lay this cornerstone, they were insisting on building their own religion and system. And that stone that came is rejected by the builders. But that stone, it says, becomes the cornerstone. And this stone, sent, rejected, and then becoming the cornerstone, that is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord sending Jesus as light to be hated by the darkness and crucified, that's the Lord's doing. The sending of the stone that the builders reject, that's the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes to see that rejected Messiah cursed, hung on a tree, and yet that very tree becomes this cross of glory. That's the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes that the rejection of unbelief that leads to the execution of Jesus is the triumph of God's salvation. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. The day of the rejection of Christ by unbelievers so that he would be crucified and lifted up, John 3 says, so that all would be drawn to him. That's the Lord's doing. The unbelief, the hardness of heart is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes because it's that rejection of the stone that leads to it being the chief cornerstone. You say, wait a minute, I was with you. I was with you in the sending of Jesus. That's the Lord's doing. I, I was with you on the, the turning upside down of the devil's plan that the rejection of Jesus on the cross becomes him lifted up for salvation. But is even the unbelief and the hardness of heart, is this to the Lord's doing? That's what we have to wrestle with in this text because it says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, this is the Lord's doing. And the question is, is it just that the stone became the cornerstone or is it that the stone was rejected and became the cornerstone? And so we turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. In any of our interpretation of Psalm 118, just remember this. That phrase, this is the day the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it, is often used for our celebration of any day. And that's not inappropriate because that is absolutely true. That verse and a whole lot of others added to it would, would remind us that God has a plan for today. And he's still at work as he has been in every day of human history but just know that verse specifically in its context is speaking to the events historically of this time of year. When Jesus is rejected and yet becomes the cornerstone, he begins building his church by his death, burial, and resurrection. 
So, oh, excuse me, hear that verse and know the Lord was accomplishing his salvation in real time on a specific day. Isaiah now, chapter 6. Perhaps one of the most familiar passages in Isaiah, at least in the opening part of the chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, if you're looking for the three greatest kings of Israel, you'd have David, 40 years, massive, massive success. Solomon, 40 years, massive success. And then Uzziah, 40 years, uh, incredible empire. Um, so one of the greats of great kings of Israel. But he too dies in a disappointing, uh, kind of disreputable way, storms into the temple and insists on being the priest, offering incense, and he immediately contracts leprosy, and he dies and is buried in a pauper's field. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is that passage where Isaiah experiences this whole other encounter vision uh, of the holiness of God. And we see that in verse 3, the, that cry of the angels, holy, holy, holy. Heaven is shaking, smoke filling the presence of God there. The prophet says in verse 5, woe is me for I am lost or undone. I am a man of unclean lips. He's purged by this burning coal of that uncleanness. And then we come to his response, which is also well known. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. That much of the story we know well. Isaiah's vision of the holy God purged of his sin and, and stirred by the mercy of God to present himself as a living sacrifice. Here I am, send me. And then we get to the actual mission on which he would be sent. Verse 9. And he said, go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? It's a little bit of a change that we often miss in Isaiah 6. Isaiah is so overwhelmed by the holiness of God in the beginning of the chapter that he can't help but say, do whatever you want to do. But then when the Lord says what he wants Isaiah to do, Isaiah immediately questions that with this question of, okay, how, how long is that going to last? And I'm we have to be careful reading into what exactly Isaiah is saying, but the, the question of how long seems to imply that that's a hard mission. It seems to imply that the prophet is struggling with being told, go and make this hard to hear so that they will not believe. Seems to fly in the face of everything we think of when we think of a prophet being sent to a people saying, thus says the Lord. And especially when you read the prophets and see again and again this call to return to me. Return, the Lord says, over and over. And now he's sending the prophet to say, make their hearts dull. Make their ears heavy. Make their eyes blind. Lest they would see and hear and understand and turn and be healed. So we understand the prophet asking, how long, O Lord? And the answer is, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and land 
is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when, it's, when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So the Lord says it's going to be a long time until everything you know around you is destroyed and even what's left, people ride through and just destroy even further, kind of like that old stump left in a field where you, you light a fire around it to burn it out and make sure it's totally gone. That's what Isaiah's message was. His great mission in life was to go and preach so that hearts would be hardened and judgment would fall on the land of Israel and they would be taken into captivity and even what was left in Israel would be run over again and again until there's literally nothing left but, but some kind of sunken hole in the ground with a little bit of root left. And, and, and Isaiah says that the seed or the remnant is down there in that stump. And later Isaiah is going to tell us of a sprig that would spring out of that stump, a branch. And that language of branch is associated with Messiah would spring forth. So Isaiah's message, his mission is to harden hearts in unbelief so that God's people will be taken captive into Babylon, so that there would be this remnant return, so all these promises of God are unfolding, and eventually we'd have this branch that would spring out of what we thought was a dead Israel, and that branch would become the life of this people. So Isaiah is long before the captivity, but he was predicting that captivity would happen. But in his words, we're not just thinking, oh, good, the nation of Israel will be restored to the land. We're thinking, oh, good, the promise of God to preserve a remnant of believing ones who believe in his promised answer, the sent one, the Messiah, the branch. Those are what is promised us at the end of Isaiah 6. Because of the hardness of heart, and the rejection of unbelievers, the Messiah will spring forth and be presented and many will believe. We love Isaiah 6 and holy, holy, holy. We love the sending of a Messiah. We can see how those things, this is the Lord's doing. But Isaiah 6 and Psalm 118 are reminding us that the Lord's doing is also to send out the light and the truth, and to have it rejected by unbelievers so that the purpose of his will would stand, Romans tells us. Isaiah 6 certainly echoes Psalm 118 and Matthew 21 that there is this heaviness of unbelief and in only one phrase in Isaiah 6 do we find the hope of a remnant. The holy seed is in that stump. Burned out from a tree already cut down. But there's hope there. In the heaviness of unbelief, there is hope. And this is how the gospel unfolds in the crucifixion of Jesus. Whether it's John 3 when the Son of Man is lifted up, well, that's not a good picture. Crucifixion is not a pretty sight, nor is what we think happening there. The Messiah has been rejected. But when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. Peter says, you crucified Jesus with evil hands, but that was the predetermined plan of God. That unbelief and hardness of heart was God's plan so that the Messiah would be lifted up and cursed on a tree so that you and I would not be cursed for all eternity. So begrudge God the hardening of hearts and causing unbelief, but you're begrudging the gospel. You're shunning the gospel as God chose to unfold it in his wisdom. We cannot escape that the hope of belief and the reality of a remnant comes out every time of a circle of unbelief, out of that heaviness of rejection. 
This goes all the way back to Eden. In Adam, all died, the heaviness of unbelief. And in the language of a curse on their unbelief comes the promise of a remnant. That the seed of the woman would be at enmity with the seed of the serpent. So out of the heaviness of unbelief and all of its consequence comes the hope of belief and a remnant. So Palm Sunday is this fascinating day of tension. For us as believers, we tend to see the, the upper kind of trajectory, the, the good news. We know that really is King Jesus riding in to accomplish salvation. But historically and biblically, we know that that day was not just all celebratory joy and, and peace and the celebration of God's work unfolding. There was also this stark, rank unbelief and indignation that that Jesus of Nazareth would make the claims that he made and do what he's doing riding into Jerusalem. So we should feel rightly on Palm Sunday, not just because we're biblically literate and we know what's coming, we should feel a tension, a heaviness when we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem because it's the same heaviness that we face today. You might gather for Easter with family and they don't celebrate Jesus risen from the dead. You're going to go to work this week or you'll talk to neighbors this week who know nothing of peace and joy and salvation in Jesus and are destined for eternal judgment. That's heaviness. So we feel the same heaviness surrounded by unbelief, but we must cling to the hope that Jesus said there are many sheep yet to be brought into the fold. And the good news is you and I aren't very good at knowing who those sheep are. So we can just rest in faith that Jesus is still saving, that there is still a remnant to be brought in. The hardest case you know, family member, friend, co-worker, is not beyond the reach of the mercy of God. If we believe Jesus who rode into Jerusalem that day truly is king and would a few years later arrest Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. There's just no match for Jesus. That's Paul's point. Hear his story and hear his words when he says, I was saved to demonstrate to all the mercy of God in saving sinners. And so Palm Sunday is a day for heaviness, but it's a day for hope. For you and I that have believed in Jesus, we rejoice and we cling to the hope that salvation's mission is not yet accomplished. Jesus is using us and our witness to continue making him known so that others would believe as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day, a historical day where we remember that dramatic week of the unfolding of the specific details of the plan of redemption, the righteous Jesus crucified in the place of sinners, buried and risen again. Lord, may we feel the heaviness this week of unbelief. Those around us, the obvious culture in which we live that lives in blatant disregard to you and to your truth, to your lordship and ownership over all creation. But may we cling to gospel hope that not even a grave could contain our Savior, that he defeated death and its consequences, its effects of sin. And now we bear this message, this good news, that Jesus saves, that he satisfies so let us cling to that hope as we see him riding triumphantly into Jerusalem. Thank you for riding triumphantly through our unbelief and into the hearts of each one of us who have believed in Jesus. Because we do hail him as king. We do give thanks for his sacrifice on our behalf. We do weep that it was our sin that held him there, but we rejoice that he remembers that sin no more. 
So what a day this is for us as your people. What a Savior we have in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.